Welcome back, and thank you for joining me for the fourth and final episode of our Spine Talk on the subject of spondylolisthesis. In this episode, we'll discuss the treatment options and prognosis for spondylolisthesis. Once we diagnose you with a symptomatic spondylolisthesis, then the first line of treatment is activity modification. This includes altering the activities in your daily routine that aggravate your symptoms. It also includes making a conscious effort to lead a spine-healthy lifestyle. If you fail to practice the tenets of a spine-healthy lifestyle, you will most likely be doomed to persistent or recurrent symptoms regardless of surgery or treatment options you undergo. The second line of treatment is medications, which usually include NSAIDs like ibuprofen. This can also include muscle relaxers and nerve medications when you have leg symptoms. There is very limited role for narcotic pain medications in the non-operative treatment of symptomatic spondylolisthesis. And in my opinion, there's no role for using these medications on a daily or near daily basis for longer than six to 12 weeks. The next level of treatment are the therapies, with physical therapy being the one with the strongest evidential support. I typically prescribe a core stabilization protocol that includes low impact aerobic exercise and flexibility training. Also included in this rung of treatment is optimizing one's mental health. Chronic pain from any source wears on everyone's psyche after a while. If you have underlying mental health disorders like depression or anxiety, your perception of pain increases. I firmly believe that patients cannot get their best spine health if we do not focus on improving both their physical and mental well-being, especially if we're considering surgery. Further, just as I would not want to take a patient to surgery whose physical problems like diabetes or high blood pressure are not fully well controlled, I would not want to take a patient to spine surgery whose mental health is not also optimized. Lastly, having an optimistic outlook and concentrating on the successes you achieve are key attributes to patients who tend to do the best when managing a symptomatic spondylolisthesis. The next level of care is injections which primarily includes epidural steroid injections. These are performed with the assistance of an x-ray machine to ensure that the needle is placed exactly where it's intended. The injections typically contain two types of medicine. One is like Novocaine. It numbs the area, and in my experience, if pain is coming from this part of your spine, then you should have a positive response to the Novocaine. The Novocaine-like medication only lasts a few hours just like when you go to the dentist. So if you get an injection, it is important to record how much pain relief you experience in the first few hours. In addition to how much and for how long you received extended pain relief. The second medication is a steroid, which is a potent anti-inflammatory that can provide a longer duration of effect for about 50% of patients who undergo these injections. These injections can provide relief for days, weeks, months, or years. If you get relief for several weeks or months, and then the symptoms recur, it's very reasonable to undergo another round of injections. Unfortunately, it's not uncommon for subsequent rounds of injections to provide less effect or for shorter durations. Finally, when these four rungs of treatment have failed to provide sufficient and lasting relief, then surgery becomes the next option to consider. An article published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007 reports the results of a multi-center trial in which the efficacy of surgery for the treatment of degenerative spondylolisthesis versus non-operative care were compared. This study, like essentially all that came before it and since, showed that in well-selected patients, surgical treatment of degenerative spondylolisthesis results in better outcomes than non-operative care and this improved benefit lasts for years following surgery. Studies looking at the outcome of surgery for lytic spondylolisthesis have shown similar results. But before you run to the surgeon's office, these results should be interpreted with context. The vast majority of patients who undergo spinal surgery for the treatment of any form of spondylolisthesis will have already undergone most, if not all, of the non-operative treatments we've discussed and they'll have experienced persistent symptoms that are severe for three to six months or longer. In fact, most patients who undergo surgery first, in fact, 
Most experience symptoms for years before they actually undergo surgery. So it's important to remember that surgery is the last option on the five rung ladder of care. It should only be undertaken, in my opinion, when the other options have been adequately trialed and failed. However, if you've reached this state, then surgery is probably your best option remaining to achieve a meaningful improvement in your symptoms. About three in four patients who undergo spine surgery for the treatment of symptomatic spondylolisthesis will experience significant improvement in their symptoms. As we mentioned in the last episode, relief of symptoms in the legs is far more common and more significant than relief of back pain. While most patients are improved, no one is cured by spine surgery, and most if not all patients will have occasional back-related symptoms following surgery. For most patients who are at the point of being disabled by their back and leg symptoms related to spondylolisthesis, the decision to undergo surgery can be the best decision they ever make. When patients respond to surgery, they are uniformly satisfied with their outcome and would recommend it to others. There are many types of surgery that can be performed to treat spondylolisthesis. The exact specifics of each are best left to a discussion between you and your surgeon since all can produce successful results. The only option typically offered for lytic spondylolisthesis is a spinal fusion. In this procedure, the spine is exposed, screws or other implants are usually placed, and bone or bone healing material is also placed to serve as a fertilizer for the bone healing process. The goal of a fusion surgery is to get the bones operated on to fuse into one solid bone, as opposed to the two or more bones that were moving abnormally and in an unhealthy fashion prior to surgery. The other option is a simple decompression. In this procedure, which is much easier, quicker, and associated with less healing time and lower complication rates, parts of the bone, ligament, and disc that are compressing the nerves are removed. Simple decompression is typically only indicated for a degenerative spondylolisthesis that has become non-mobile. Uh, where the spine is almost, if not already, completely fused on its own. That said, even in those cases, a simple decompression surgery can result in a progression of the slip and need for more surgery at the same level. I do not believe that this is the best option for most patients with a degenerative slip. And this is consistent with the results of the New England Journal of Medicine article we have discussed in which about 95% of patients who underwent surgery at one of the 13 medical centers involved in that trial had a spinal fusion and not just a simple decompression. Your best surgical fusion option is probably the option that your surgeon feels most comfortable with and for which he or she has the greatest experience. There are minimally invasive options that we perform here at the Mayo Clinic that can reduce some of the collateral damage associated with major spinal surgery but these minimally invasive techniques only seem to improve benefits in the short term when compared to traditional open techniques. In the end, it's probably far more important that the surgery is done well than what specific technique is used. When a lytic spondylolisthesis is present, it's not uncommon for your surgeon to recommend a front side surgery or a front and back side surgery. This provides the greatest ability to control the spine and reduce the slippage producing a solid, well-aligned fusion. In addition, when you approach the front of the spine by going through the abdomen, you avoid dissecting and irritating the back muscles and tissue, which are themselves known to be pain generators. Well, I really appreciate your willingness to listen to me share my thoughts on the subject of spondylolisthesis over this four-episode series. This is a very common condition, which fortunately needs no specific treatment in the vast majority of cases. When it becomes symptomatic, and when these symptoms fail to respond to non-operative measures, as we've described, then spinal surgery is an appropriate option, and it results in significant benefits in about 75% of patients. If after reviewing all the episodes in this series, you have additional questions or would like to request an appointment to be seen at the Mayo Clinic for your spinal condition, please use the information displayed on the screen to contact us. Again, I'm Brett Friedman, and it's been a pleasure spending this time together with you. Thank you, and be well.